Welcome back to the Course Creation Incubator. I'm Gina Onativia, an online course coach consultant, and today I wanna to talk about copy, specifically email copy, and how to improve your open and click-through rates for your weekly nurtures. And we're gonna talk it through with my dear, dear friend and an incredible copywriter, Megan O'Leary. So I finally got my act together with consistent weekly nurtures for this podcast. And I think it's truly important for you as a course creator to get those weekly nurtures out. I don't care if your list is 50 people or 50,000 people, you wanna be nurturing them each and every week. So you deliver your expertise, you show them that you're there consistently. So you're nurturing your audience and adding value between course promotions. Also, I want your emails landing so that when you continue to nurture, you can convert that list. And for me, so much love and work goes into this podcast. And if you have a podcast, I know you know how much work goes into that content creation and putting it out there each and every week. So I want to make sure this podcast is getting listeners and emails and those weekly nurtures have a lot to do with that. When my opens and click throughs started to dip a little bit, I reached out to my longtime collaborator, Megan O'Leary. Now, Megan is the best copywriter I know. She teaches copywriting and sales pages in all of my accelerator classes and events. And if you're listening and you've seen her present, you know how amazing she is. We build campaigns together for Bo Eason. She has written for folks like Grant Cardone, Frank Kern, Tony Robbins, Ryan Levesque, JJ Virgin. Shall I go on? I mean, she is a superstar. Plus, she is just one of the nicest, most generous people you will ever meet. Okay, so back to those nurture campaigns I was talking about. Thanks to Megan, I'm seeing a five to seven percent increase in opens now and much better click throughs. So I thought we could walk through the process that Megan did with me to boost your own results. All right, let's dive in. Welcome to the podcast, O'Leary. I like that even in the podcast, you call me O'Leary, which is entirely appropriate because when my parents named me, they had no many, no idea how many Megans would be in my generation. So I respond way better to O'Leary than Megan as it is. I can't help it. I got to call you O'Leary. So let's dive in. In the beginning of this episode, I talk about how you've been helping me try to figure out how to improve my open rates and my click-throughs. So I want to talk about your approach to nurture emails. Absolutely. And, you know, as we talked about the other day, what I love with you about Eugenia is that we pitch and catch on these topics all the time. And the other day, I sort of admitted that I was a little freaked out about coming up with a recipe for writing nurture emails. I said, you know, I just, I don't want to put it in a box. I don't know if I can put it in a box. (laughs) And you wisely said, well, I think it's more of like an art and a science. And I was like, ding, 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 ding. And so it is. So, you know, we're going to talk through some of the pointers today. We're going to talk a little bit maybe about the science today. Um, But I do want to acknowledge that it's a little bit of an art and we'll even touch on that today. What happens when inspiration doesn't strike, you know, um, So first and foremost, like, I just want to acknowledge that there is technique, there is strategy, there is practice, and then sometimes lightning strikes in in these situations. Very much so, very much so. Okay, let's jump in because I know you've got a five-step process to, to share with us. What's step one in terms of our approach to writing awesome nurture emails? Well, this might sound kind of basic to some people, but I have to say that it's something I talk about with clients all the time. And step number one is, what is this email for? What are we doing here? What's the intention of this email? And a lot of times I'll get an answer, like a three-part answer or a four-part answer. And really, I really want a one-part answer to this question. <laughs> yeah, you do. I really want, like, I want them to get into module one and watch the intro video, or I want them to join my Facebook group and start interacting in the portal. And so as much as you can, I like to use the old direct response rule of one action per one email. It just makes things a lot easier. And yes, 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 you will see exceptions to this rule. But especially if you're doing your own copywriting and you're starting out, focus on asking people to do one thing in the email and it's just going to make your life a lot easier. And then one more trick about this. So when we ask them to do one thing in direct response parlance, we call that a CTA, which is a call Mm -hmm. to action. And 
Um, something I learned very early from a mentor of mine, I guess we're going to, maybe we're going to talk about him a little later too. Um, Ed Rush, he is a consultant, um, does a lot of sales consulting, is a great copywriter in his own right. And he always encouraged me to try to get the CTA up as high in the email as you can, because a theme we're going to talk about today is people are busy. They don't yep. want to be spending time in their email inbox. That's so, right. um, you know, I'm all for storytelling. We'll talk about that. Yep. But first and foremost, as high up as you can get what you want them to do, the better off you're going to be. And, you know, you can work on being creative with that, but um, push it up as, as high up as you can. That's great. So, and the question I'm always asking on this podcast is asking yourself, what's this, what's the outcome, right? So I think that's <laughs> what we're starting with here. Absolutely. I think it's a great guide to marketing in general is yeah. understanding what your outcome is before you even start putting pen to paper, like get it very clear in your mind before you even start to execute. Okay, let's move on to, to step two. And I think sometimes we don't ask this question. So what's the second step here, O'Leary? Yeah, step number two is, is what's the hook of this email? And a hook is another kind of direct response term that maybe we should explain a little bit, but mm -hmm. it's kind of like the central idea or the metaphor that brings everything together, something that makes people stop scrolling and listen. Yeah. So, um, Emails are a lot more powerful when they have a hook. Um, maybe I can give an example actually from yeah, your emails. Um, okay. And I have another one too, but we were just doing this the other day. So um, Gina has published a podcast about a coworker of ours who is a secret Instagram influencer. And the first draft of the email was good, but it just lacked that oomph, right? It was mm -hmm. just sort of like, hey, we know someone, she's an influencer, she's gonna be on the podcast. And what we rolled it back to, um, and I think this is your hook, Gina, is my coworker has a secret identity. Great hook, right? Like this idea, it just conjures images of like Superman or spies or secret identity. And so we spun it all on this idea of what happens when someone you work with turns out to have a secret identity. That to me was a great hook and it made that email way more memorable than it would have been sort of just kind of spinning out the ideas. Um, one from our mutual client, Bo Eason. Yeah. Um, the hook there was why you need more obstacles in your life. Mm, and I, I like love that. that idea because, you know, so many times we bemoan the obstacles in our life. Oh, I can't do it because of X, Y, Z, or I'm too old or whatever. And Bo's point is that obstacles make you interesting. Obstacles make you struggle. And so that was a great hook about wanting more obstacles in your life. Um, I've got another great one. I don't even know how to pronounce this guy's name. God bless him. I think it's pronounced K High. He's one of our um, mutual. Uh, yes, we've, our we mutual, draw inspiration um, from him. Totally, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes too about yeah. our secret heroes of copywriting. I'll put him in the show notes, in case we are, are not saying his name correctly. <laughs> great, and I apologize um, to him in advance. I meant to look that up, and I I missed that one. But he was writing, he writes a lot about productivity for entrepreneurs. And he wrote this great email about Gmail productivity, which honestly, it's a pretty dry topic, right? How to use your yes. Gmail inbox to organize your life. Right. So what he wrapped it around was getting married to his wife eight years ago. And when they got married, she was going to change her name. And then she decided not to do it. And it turned out the uh, email about changing her name with the instructions had sat in her Gmail inbox for six years before she finally decided not to change oh. her name at all. But what a brilliant hook, right? You take a really dry topic, Gmail productivity, wrap it in this idea of a woman changing her name, which is a topic that's kind of of other interest to me. And um, bam, you have a, a much more interesting email. So hooks are what you are going to be looking for when you are writing your emails. So something that really grabs the reader from the onset, right? And something that really evokes emotion, I think, is what we're after here. Absolutely. Um, and I think we'll talk about emotion in a little bit because it's yep. a topic that's worthy of, of a little more discussion. Definitely. But the way I like to think of it, and this is going to lead right into step number three. I is, like it. Um, Do it. <laughs> You know, think of your email inbox, like, or think of your prospect's email inbox, your customer's email inbox as like a cocktail party where a hundred people are shouting at the same time. What are you going to say that's going to make them go, v -v 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 wait, what does that person have to say? Like our, t our attention is so divided. So a controversial hook is one that's going to get your email so much more attention. Yeah. I, I totally understand that. We're all trying to get attention these days. Okay. So step three. 
hit me. Step three leads right into it. So um, what are you really going to get people's attention with is a subject line yeah. is be thoughtful with your subject lines and also your preview lines. Um, so just in case you don't know what that is, um, I'll use Gmail as an example. Like when yeah. you look at an email in your Gmail inbox, the subject line is going to be in bold. And then following the bold is a uh, text that continues that's not in bold. And you can customize that text using what's called a preview line. If you decide not to use a preview line, it'll pull from the first part of your email. So, you know, whereas sometimes we think of just, just a subject line, you have a fair amount of real estate there. I counted it up the other day. It's about 150 characters. And okay. the key there is you're going to need to use that real estate as judiciously as possible. How can you get that controversial hook up front? You know, can you say something shocking? Can you turn something on its head? You know, that example from Bo, the subject line was why you need more obstacles in your life. And that's kind of like a huh to, to the reader that makes them stop and listen. So what's uh, the best way to kind of see what's showing up for you is when you test your emails, look at them in your inbox and see how they show up. I can't tell you how many people don't do that because I get emails with like just junk in the preview line that say something like, I don't know, your value store or something like right, that. Um, way. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, don't, don't waste your, your subject line on that. Um, so the other thing you don't want to waste your subject line in on is like a very long, hi, so-and-so. So if you'll yeah. notice with my emails, Gina, a lot of times I don't start them with hi, so-and-so. Um, it's not that personal. You know, if you mm -hmm. eliminate that, you're not killing the personality of the email. Um, in fact, sometimes when you're writing a friend, you don't even write hi, so-and-so. You, you just say like, are it. you going to this party tomorrow? Exactly. Question mark, you get right? straight to the point. Absolutely. Yeah. So don't be afraid to move that high so-and-so, kill that high so-and-so, because that gives you a few more characters in the preview subject line. So just remember, you're in this giant cocktail party, 100 people are shouting, what are you going to say in this subject line that's going to make someone sit up and take notice? Okay, I love that. And then let's go on to step four here, O'Leary. Uh, this is another question that we don't ask ourselves, right? Like, what, well, let's talk about it. You hit it. Go. Absolutely. So the question is, what's the benefit? What's the, we call it the what's in it for me here. Mm -hmm. um, and this kind of goes back to your, your call to action, right? You're asking someone to do something. And in order to motivate them to do that, you've got to tell them why it's awesome. You've got to explain to them exactly what they're going to get out of doing this. And I think this is so hard for content creators sometimes because when you're doing your own copywriting, in your mind, it's just like so clear why you included everything that you included in your course, right? If you've it done- It happens to me all the time. <laughs> it happens to the best of us. You know, you if you've spent time on a post-it note exercise and you've, you've carefully laid out every element of your course, you know exactly why it's all there, but you right. just have to explain it to you people. You have to communicate it, right. Absolutely. Yeah. So the magic phrase that I learned from another mentor of mine, I got to give Mike Koenig's credit for this one. Okay. Um, I know, right? It's nice. uh, his phrase is so you can. Yeah. That is the magic phrase to add on to just about any feature to get a benefit. So let's take one, you know, that something that people are doing all the time is like a weekly coaching call. How many people attack on a weekly coaching call to their course, right? Alone, it's kind of a flat concept. It's, right. I mean, um, I don't know, I'm not that interested in weekly group coaching. So let's tack on the so you can to that, you know, join my weekly coaching call so you can talk about where you're getting stuck and we'll brainstorm solutions together. Ooh, Suddenly that sounds yeah. like a more interesting coaching call to me or so you can get feedback about how this week's lesson applies exactly to your own business. I mean, suddenly so you can makes it so much more important to the person reading. So just make sure that everything that you're offering people has a so you can, a benefit of what's in it for me in these emails. I love this. And O'Leary, you would also tell me that how can we reframe that weekly coaching call or sex up that name, right? And you're laughing because this is another podcast and we'll have to bring you back, O'Leary, to talk about how we're framing your course uh, course name, the different pieces of your course and everything like that. So, um, but that's another podcast. We'll have O'Leary back. Okay. So we need that benefit. We need the, so you can give me the fifth and final step. This one is pretty simple. Keep it as short as you can. I mean, we're all start, you know, divided attention is yep. the norm today. So, um, you know, one of the things that I've heard from a lot of copywriting mentors is go back and cut the fluff. 
And, you know, even the best of us, I'm not even necessarily calling myself the best. What I mean is even those of us who do this professionally for a living, we sometimes have a tendency to fall in love with our own copy. Definitely. And it's important <laughs> to, uh, a, a teacher of mine put it once, to kill your darlings. You know, it's, mm -hmm. if there's anything you can cut and still maintain the meaning of the message, do it. Because the shorter, the better, in my opinion. Okay. So you've got the five steps check those out. I want you, if you're listening right now, go and review them. And I know one thing you tell me all the time is to make it personal. So I get that for social media. I kind of get that for social media. I think it's harder with our nurture emails because I think, why do they care, right? Like, why am I pulling in more of me? So why do we need to make it more personal with our emails? That's a, that's a really good question. I, I love the, why do they care question? And truly they probably don't care what kind of dog you have, you know? Um, <laughs> so it's the kind of thing I think you definitely have to wrap in a lesson. So just to be clear, yes. please don't send nurture emails that are like, I don't know about how, about the last vacation you went on, unless there's a lesson embedded there. But at the end of the day, you kind of have a choice. You can either send sort of dry, impersonal business only emails, or you can send sort of more fun, personal emails that really reveal who you are and the things that are cool about you. And in my opinion, the personal emails are just, they're more fun. Like otherwise they're just kind of boring. Um, I heard a story recently that I thought was kind of interesting. Um, I have a teacher who happens to be a, a therapist and he was telling the story of one of his clients who was just boring him to tears. And this, this story surprised me because I've never heard a therapist admit that they were bored by their client. And he was really struggling with it because he's a really sweet guy. And he was like, why is this guy so boring? And he realized it's because the guy would never get into anything personal. He would just mm. come in, sit down and, and he would just go through like the facts of the day, the facts of the week. And the guy would never open up and really reveal anything deeper about himself. And it made me think that when you write personal emails, it creates a personal connection with people and it creates stickiness that's gonna stay with you for years. And the thing about this is to find you a couple examples, I thought back to the emails that impacted me and these came months ago, weeks ago. I mean, and I still remember them. And I think that's really significant um, because these things stick with us. Like one of our mutual, uh, copy heroes is uh, Tarzan K. Mm -hmm. And she wrote an email titled Money, Cars, and Instagram Fame. And it was about putting her Land Rover up for sale. And what it was really about was, gosh, I couldn't even tell you what it was really about. It had a right. lesson. Yes. It had a lesson, but um, she was really real about the fact that, you know, she had a couple great launches, bought a really nice car, and then realized that's, I think this is what it was, that she realized that money isn't really what it's all about, that impacting lives is what it's really all about. But I remember that email for months um, and it made me really like her, you know? Yeah. Um, also another of our heroes is Laura Belgray. Yes. Uh, talking shrimp fame. Um, she always has just a way of adding a personal touch to, um, to stories that could be really bland and dry. Like she wrote this, um, this thing called 21 ways to write million dollar emails, which is still pretty good. But she wrapped it in this story about buying Bitcoin at the high and people were making fun of her because she invested in Bitcoin in the high. And um, it made me remember that for a really, a really long time. Um, and then just one more example of um, from another of our heroes, Frank Kern. Um, we talked about this lately, right? That um, so Frank is doing a free challenge, a five day challenge. And he wrote this email about how he's never done a free challenge before. He's always made people pay because he really believes that if people pay, people pay attention. Right. He's like, this might fail. This might fall flat on its face, but I'm gonna try it. And if you wanna watch me fail and fall flat on my face, come on and join this challenge. And it turned something that would have been just like, oh, Frank Kern's doing another challenge into kind of a spectacle, right? It leverages right. voyeurism. Yeah, so this I was is just gonna say it's transparency, right? And yes. all three of those examples are putting it out there for you in, in bold ways, bold, vulnerable, transparent ways. Absolutely. They, um, you know, that, that impulse to like peek in someone's window as you mm -hmm. walk by, um, it leverages that, that aspect of, of voyeurism and the possibility of someone just 
tripping flat on their face. I think that's, you know, like the Dick Van Dyke show when he opened up the show and he tripped over the footstool because he said people <laughs> like to see other people get hurt. Anyway, <laughs> um, all this is to say, get as personal as you as you can and feel comfortable with. Just make sure you wrap it in a lesson. Which exactly, all of these right. Wrap some content mentioned. around it. Yep. Yeah. I remember uh, when I was working on Amy's, Amy Porterfield's podcast, and she, in the old days, just when she was starting out with just deliver content workshops. And then when she really started to share her personal side of herself, like that's, I feel like when it really took off, people were really invested in her. They wanted to learn how the personal side impacted the business side uh, and people wanted more. Right. So, and she always beautifully wrapped it in a lesson or some kind of content. Amy is definitely the master of that. She yeah. always brings it back to a great lesson. And um, I think her newest podcast, you know, on body shaming and loving your body and getting comfortable in your own body is a great example of the way that she's opened the door to that a couple of times. And it's, it's stuck with me. Um, yeah. Definitely something I remember about her. Yeah. So, okay. So that's awesome about putting the personal touch into your emails. Another question I have for you is let's go back to the hooks discussion. Sometimes I get stuck. I've got to admit, like I don't have inspiration. What are some of your insights or tricks or questions we can ask when we get stuck, not coming up with a great hook for our emails? Sure. It's, it's a good one. And, um, hooks definitely require a little bit of inspiration. Um, so I think it's, it's hard to formulate, uh, a solution every time, but a yeah. couple of things that have worked for me. Okay. Um, number one is I always leave time because yeah. it's really hard to be inspired on the clock. Like, Hey, come up with something fantastic in the next 15 minutes. It, it doesn't, it, it doesn't happen for me. I'm, I'm just not that kind that of writer. It doesn't writers. happen for me either. I definitely okay. have to give myself room for that. Yeah. <laughs> That makes me feel better to know that. So yeah. leave time. And then I, I would say the second thing is you've always got to be filling up the well. I think that's a phrase from Julia Cameron and the artist's way. And the way you fill up the well is by um, reading what other people are doing, getting, getting inspired. So yeah. we've talked about our copy heroes in this call. I could probably spend all day just running you down a list of 20, 30 people who I've followed in my, in my time. Find someone who does it well, who you like, subscribe to them. You know what? Find people you don't like too, because they're going to push you to think in, yep. in different ways. So when you're starting out and this is something you want to do, um, either as a course creator or as a copywriter, subscribe to as many people as you can, devour them, read them, um, see what other people are doing. And I'm going to say, draw inspiration from them. You know, no one, I, I'm not suggesting you copy what people are doing, but see what, see what they're doing. What are their ideas? How are they leveraging stuff? And then, you know, that'll be in your sort of consciousness in the future. So when you get stuck, you know, you can say, oh man, you know, I remember that email I read the other day. Maybe I could do something like that. So that's a, a good way to, um, to keep the well full. Um, one other thing I think about sometimes is how I would explain it to a friend. You know, if, if mm -hmm. um, like, you know, how would I explain it to you, Gina? If I just needed to communicate um, something really important to you, how would I start the conversation? What would I, how would I sum it up to you? Um, I think that that empathy exercise can sometimes, um, can sometimes trigger new thoughts. And then sometimes you just need to take a break. Um, yeah. A lot of times if I'm grinding on something, I'll take the dog for a walk, I'll work out, I'll take a shower and just let those ideas percolate. And then um, often inspiration will strike. Um, and sometimes you just have to write an okay email, you know, just, you have to be okay with it, but every email isn't going to be <laughs> a flash email, in the not pan. Not every email is going to be a home run, right? O'Leary? No, yeah. no. And taking a break, uh, Bo Eason, we've talked about Bo a couple of times in this podcast and Bo talks about recovery, right? And resting our brains and resting our bodies and giving ourselves that time to just uh, refresh ourselves so we can come back more inspired than ever, right? To sit down and, and think of that creative hook. So uh, love that. Give yourself time to recover. Okay, final question for you. And O'Leary, obviously we're gonna have you back because we gotta keep talking about <laughs> writing and emails and sales pages. Like we could, we could talk to O'Leary about many things. She's a genius. Uh, one of my intentions this year is to become a better writer. I recommended back in podcast 21 to hire or find somebody who can come in over the top and help you tweak uh, your direct response. Uh, what rituals or advice do you have for us to become better writers? And and you mentioned some of them like 
uh, subscribing to these heroes, writing heroes, but do you have any other advice for us to become better nurture email writers? You know, when you um, told me you were going to ask me this question, I kind of thought back to my first serious copywriting job when I was living in New York. I was 25 years old. Um, I was basically like Peggy Olson from Mad Men. I I moved to New York. (laughs) You know, it was, what was tough was that it was hard to explain what I did before Mad Men, post Mad Men. I'm like, oh, I was Peggy Olson. And people are like, oh, oh, I understand what you did. Um, But it was my first big copywriting job. And I have to say that I was freaked out because I saw this as like a test. Like, is this, I'm going either going to make it in this city or I'm going to get broken by this city. So (laughs) Um, I did a lot of things back then. And um, one of which was that I started to read Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. And it was a recommendation from another copywriter, uh, someone I subscribed to, a hero. And what I just loved is the simple psychology that Dale Carnegie employed. Um, He says things like, you know, the thing people, the word people love most is their own name. I mean, it's just a very simple book on influence Um, that's not sketchy, it's not slimy, it's not the kind of stuff that you're going to feel gross about, but it'll give you a great foundation in understanding the power and the the way to influence people ethically to live a happier, better life. I mean, Dale Carnegie was a very pure soul and it's a a great read and it, it revolutionized the way I even relate to people, not only my copywriting. So highly recommend that. Um, There are a bunch of other copywriting books out there if you want to, um, geek out on them, but that one really floats to the top year after year as, as a classic. Um, we mentioned this a little already, definitely subscribe to a bunch of people. Um, I devoured as much as possible. And I have to say like there, I'll have like a flavor of the month that I will get excited about. And Gina can tell you for like a month, I'll be like, oh, guess what this guy said this week? Like forward, forward, forward. Well, I love like, it because O'Leary this. sends me all the emails. She's like, look at this or check out how they frame that. And I love it. You're, you're always keeping me fresh because you're sending me stuff that you're inspired by and you're the best. So it's amazing. Well, I'm glad you enjoy it because I need someone to share these things with. <laughs> um, I also have an amazing emails label in my Gmail because sometimes it's hard to remember, you know, what was great. So it's just a label that literally says amazing emails. And if I like an email, I stick it on there. Um, there's also a website, by the way, called reallygoodemails.com. Okay. And um, it's it's a great resource for emails across different genres. Um, but I just want to circle back to what you said, Gina, because I think it's been really helpful is having a copywriter to coach you a little bit. Yep. Um, I think can just raise your level a little bit because what you're doing, Gina, is you're forcing yourself to learn how to write copy as opposed to just handing it off to someone else. By the way, there's no shame in that, um, in just saying copywriting isn't what I want to do and then hiring a copywriter, but your aspirations are different. And we kind of, it's almost like we're doing what we did in school, right? It's like you write an essay and I like, I give you the pointers and then you rewrite the essay and we, we call it a done project. But I think that's the best way to learn is to find a mentor or someone else who can coach you so that you can get real-time feedback on what you're doing. Um, And I guess the other thing, and you know, everybody knows this, but nobody does it, is to look at your analytics. We haven't talked about that a lot today, Um, but you know, we have all the analytics we need at our fingertips. It can be sometimes hard to separate the metrics that matter from the metrics that don't. But I mean, gosh, Gina and I have worked in a lot of businesses and the number of businesses who actually use those metrics and look at them it's like they just get overlooked because there's no time. You know, we're, right. it's like we're on to the next sales promotion and there's revenue to be brought in the door. So we don't sp- always spend the time to look at the best emails that are, that are converting and see why they're converting and look at your bombs. Look at, look at what's not converting. That is such a great point too, O'Leary, because sometimes I think I write this brilliant email and then it totally bombs, right? So it doesn't connect or that's not what my audience wants to hear. So I think we need to be very cognizant of that, right? Going back to like not falling in love with your own content or not falling in love with what you're writing. It's it's really, it's called direct response for a reason, right? Absolutely. And I think you learn that lesson in social media much more visibly and much more quickly, right? I mean, yeah, how many times do you write that post that you're like, oh, this is the most brilliant social post I've ever written. And it gets like two likes. <laughs> and then for me, I post a photo of my dog and it gets like 150 likes. Right. So- <laughs> Um, I mean, 
because they're so visible on social, I think we work on them harder because everybody can see them and there's like shame associated with it. Whereas your email statistics are quietly your own. So, but we should be bringing those more into the, into the light and, um, and using them to get better. hundred percent. Yes. I, I totally agree. O'Leary, I loved having you on. We're going to have you back. And I always say that you're so booked. You don't have a website. Like O'Leary is one of those people who just, she doesn't have a business card. Like you, you don't have a presence because you're so booked. You're, you're so prolific. However, you are actually working on something right now that everyone needs to, to buy and check out. Tell me about your new book. Uh, thank you. That's a very, a very kind introduction. So after, um, let's see, I, I could call it 10 years of struggle, or I could call it probably 18 years of struggle because ever since I graduated college, I've always wanted to write a book. And um, I've written two at this point, one's in a drawer, but more excitingly, I've written <laughs> one that uh, I hope to have on Amazon uh, very shortly. It's a, a detective novel set in St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands, where I lived for four, five, six years-ish. Um, so uh, it's a labor of love. I am um, simultaneously thrilled and terrified to be putting out something under my own name. I'm sure you course creators can relate to that, right? Yes, that suddenly, definitely. Here's, here's you in yep. marquee headline lights. That's so right. um, yes, um, however, I will have a sneak peek of the book up on meganoleary.com because I now have a website because <gasps> I have a product to sell. You have a product so. to sell. That's yes. Right. Amen. So um, if you want to come take a sneak peek at the first couple of chapters, um, take a little visit to the U.S. Virgin Islands with me and my detective, Lizzie Jordan. Uh, I'd love to have you. And then I can uh, let you know when the book comes out. Perfect. So visit MeganO'Leary.com. We'll put it in the show notes for a sneak preview of the book. It's a must read. It's going to be absolutely brilliant. I already know it. So thanks so much, O'Leary, for being on. This was a blast. Uh, it's always my pleasure, Gina. Wow, how incredible is O'Leary. Every time I chat with her, even if it's for 20 minutes, I learn so much. So please, please make sure to check out her website, MeganO'Leary.com for a sneak preview of her new book. I'll see you next week. Please rate and review this episode, especially if you're listening on iTunes and then subscribe. I would love to get the word out to the course creator community. And by the way, if you haven't subscribed to my email list, do it now so you can get first dibs on knowing about my six-week accelerator, different events, lives, and more industry insights. I don't want you to miss one course creation tip. Until next week, go create, be you and be brilliant, and get it done.